Like I thought, you kind of, I couldn't take the fork, and then I really realized it was cold, and I put it on, and I was like, should this be? <laughs> like I called the waiter, over and I was like, should it be cold? Do like, yeah, it's seriously, like they act like it was just a normal thing, and it probably is. It's like we change your time, like I don't know, like maybe ten cold. Yeah. So but good for you to try that up. That is cool. Yeah, I will. I will. Just had a couple of last time. Well, I, I know it by I know it by memory. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. It's I make it so much. Yeah. That's the new right now. Nope. Wasn't for me. I tried oysters when I was in Alabama. My boyfriend, I think I know. I did like them, but I only tried one because, like, the ones like straight out of the. Those are good. Have you? They're good, but like, I had one of them, and that was nothing. You know what I mean? Like, it was good the one time. Ah, you're going to raise it in the midline. 
But if you have a lesion on one side, let's say the right side, and I say ah, the left side is going to take the uvula and point it towards the side of the lesion. See, the left side's working. It's going to lift it up. The uvula will point towards it. I mean, excuse me, point away from okay, the side. Okay, of the, lesion. Like, the tongue points towards the side of the lesion. The uh, uvula points away from the side of the lesion. So there's a little data and a sensor on each side making up the four muscles that act on the uvula. Yeah. Right. But you don't test the tensor. You just test the levators by opening them out, saying, ah. If we look in this uh, sagittal view here, one of the things that I want to, uh, well, the things that are underlying are the things that you need to pay attention to. The prevertebral fascia, it runs in front of the vertebra. The buccopharyngeal fascia, or the pretracheal fascia, runs or surrounds the uh, trachea and the esophagus. If you go back to that cross section of the neck that shows the different fascial planes. So between these two, there is a potential space. And ordinarily, there is no space, but there is a potential space. If bacteria, and I mentioned this before, if bacteria from the oral cavity gets into that space, it can descend all the way down into the chest cavity. That's the love of example that I mentioned before. The what? Ludwig's angina. Don't say angina. Angina. It's like Uranus and Uranus. Don't say Uranus. Say Uranus. You know what I mean? Okay, you kind of got me off now. Now, there are, uh, I'm sorry, sorry where these structures, was it between? Well, it's just a potential space. Yeah. Ordinarily, those are, are have some loose connective tissue to them. But when you open the, the, the bisect the head today, you can take your finger and put down in that space and just run it down as far as it'll go. Uh, and that's what happens with bacteria as well. I mentioned earlier that this is the oral cavity proper, and this right here is the oropharynx. The part above the soft palate up here in the back of the nose, that's called the nasopharynx. And then when you get down into the uh, level of the, the cartilages here, that's the laryngopharynx. And by the way, Pay close attention to where the N and the Y fall in those two words. It's not larynx or pharynx. It's larynx and pharynx. If you say on a clinical rotation, oh, I think you got a problem with the larynx, they're going to tell you to take your trailer park ass on out of the <laughs> Okay, it's pharynx, larynx. Okay. I wasn't talking about any specific person. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've talked to you about two types of tonsils. The lingual tonsils you see here. The palatine tonsils would be right there. They're not on this illustration. But if you go up here into the nasal cavity, right there above the uh, soft palate, there's another tonsillar bed. Those are called the pharyngeal tonsils. The pharyngeal tonsils sit above the soft palate. When these things get inflamed, they're called adenoids. Adenoids decrease in size as you age. So that by the, by the time you're in your late teens, you really don't have much in the way of adenoids anymore. They degenerate. They involute. 
they actually turn it fat. So if you had them removed from your little and you don't have those tonsils up in here? Right. So what they do for uh, recurrent strep throats, if you have more than six a year, or uh, snoring, little kids that snore, or they mouth breathe <coughs> because their amyloids are so large, they do what's called a TNA, tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. But as you get older, really a, the adenoids have regressed so much, you really only do tonsillectomies in people who age. Like for obstructive sleep apnea, that would be one of the treatments for it. Okay. That's, by the way, I forgot one of the underlying things. That space behind the uh, pharyngeal wall is called the retropharyngeal space. If you get infection back there, it's called, a, uh, it can form a retropharyngeal abscess. When you look at somebody's throat, and the back wall of the pharynx, or a pharynx, is poking out towards you, protruding out towards you, then that's a pretty good sign that there's something behind it. Uh, you better do some investigating. <coughs> Retropharyngeal abscess. The nasopharynx uh, we're going to uh, talk about tomorrow. The reason I put this in here is because Right there is the opening of the auditory tube, or the eustachian tube. This is where you'll find the pharyngeal tonsils, right here. Like along that recess right there. Now there's a, there's a swelling around that tube there, the opening of the auditory tube. That's called the torus tuberus. Torus tuber, what the hell is that? Oh, it's a message. Oh, I never get messages. <laughs> Torus tuberus is this swelling. You're going to see this today in the lab. And you see there's a fold coming off the back side of it. And that's why it's in today's talk. That fold is called the salpingo, S A L. P-H-I-N-G-O pharyngeal fold. Salpingo, I may have put too many letters in there. Salpingo <laughs> pharyngeal fold. Salpinx, it means tube. So that the eustachian tube is a salpinx. Your fallopian tube is called the salpinx. So salpingo pharyngeal fold, by pharyngeal, it, it goes down into the oropharynx. So you'll see it today. Now, pingo pharyngeal fold. Here's a little bit of important stuff. Uh, again, I even put arrows on this one. <laughs> pharyngeal tonsils are right there. There's the salpingo pharyngeal fold in this illustration here. You can see the uh, tensor and uh, levator veli palatini muscle fibers within the soft palate. There's the palatoglossal fold, palatopharyngeal fold. That would be the bed of the tonsils right there. You can see these folds really well uh, in a, in a uh, person. If you can get them to relax the back, relax their tongue and say, ah, you should be able to identify these pillars, anterior, posterior pillar, also called arches or folds. Okay? You said you didn't have a uvula? Somebody doesn't have a uvula? Frenulum. A, a frenulum. Oh, you don't have a frenulum. Oh, okay. So you can like touch the back of your head with your tongue? Oh, yeah, look at that. Um, so this is the uh, palatoglossal fold with the palatoglossus muscle. There's the palatopharyngeus muscle. When you remove, remove the mucosa, you'll see these little muscles. This is the bed of the tonsils. You'll find the ninth nerve there. 
there's the stylo, uh, so the styloglossus muscle is here. I mentioned earlier you can see it. Well, you can see it in the bed of the tonsil. The, thing, the point that I really want to make about this slide, though, is that artery. That artery is, is the tonsillar branch of the facial artery. So as the facial artery comes up through here, it gives off a branch that dives deep into that tonsillar bed. When you're doing tonsillectomies and you don't clip that artery, it can bleed profusely. Does that happen to you? Yeah. Uh, you could actually uh, uh, aspirate, you could die. Uh, I think that was American Really? Yeah. It's a, it's a mess when that thing starts bleeding. What do you think the ninth nerve is doing at that point right there? What is it going to be doing? There's the tongue, posterior one third of the tongue. That nerve is carrying taste from the posterior one third and somatic apparent sensation to the posterior one third of the tongue. These things are called constrictors. There are three. So if you have the oral cavity, as the oral cavity goes up, you have three muscles that wrap around the back of the pharynx. So this is the back <coughs> right here. There's a, actually a median refei. Just look at it from the back. If you look at it from the side, it looks like this. Here's the esophagus. And you have these three muscles that wrap around and attach to the front. This one attaches to the pterygomandibular raphe. Right there, that's that thing when you put your, you know that ligament right here? That's where the superior constrictor attaches. The middle constrictor attaches to the hyoid bone. The inferior constrictor attaches to the thyroid cartilage. The back side of these constrictors overlap with each other. You see them overlapping there. And what they do is that they, it's like a funnel of somatic efferent muscle. You control swallowing. When you swallow, once that bolus of saliva or food or whatever reaches the back of your throat, the constrictors take over and propel it down towards the esophagus. Once it gets down here to the esophagus, then it becomes autonomic control. But you control the origin of swallowing by the constrictors and the movement of the tongue muscles. When you look at these, this uh, view right here, you can see how thin these constrictors are. They're very thin, so it doesn't take much for bacteria to get through there to enter that retropharyngeal space. You also notice that from the back side here, if you're looking at the constrictors, you can see the superior cervical chain ganglion and the sensory ganglion of 10, which is called the nodose ganglion. Let's see if I can see it up there on the slide. <coughs> that should be it right there. <coughs> Sensory ganglion of the vagus nerve is called nodos, N-O-D-O-S-E, nodos ganglion. That nodos ganglion is kind of interesting because if you look at the vagus nerve, it runs your heart, your lungs, and most of your GI tract. But if you look at the vagus nerve in your neck, 90% of the vagus nerve is sensory. Only 10% of the axons in there are motor. 90% are sensory with their cell bodies in the nodose ganglion. So does that mean that there's no synapses in the ganglion? There's no synapse in that ganglion. It's a sensory ganglion. So all of the regulatory mechanisms from your heart, your lungs, your GI tract, they're telling your brain how fast your heart's beating, how dilated your stomach is, and all this kind of stuff, has their cell bodies in that nodos ganglion. Right. We can find the nodos ganglion today 
and bisect the hip and remove one side of the head or free it up, pull it forward, you can follow the vagus nerve in the neck, you can follow it up to the base of the skull. And that nodose ganglion is pretty large. It's, it's stunningly large. If we look in the oral cavity here, there are all sorts of things you can see. Uh, in the top here are the tonsils with, um, when you look at tonsils there, you want to look at for things like pustules and exudates. A pustule is like a pus, a pus pocket. An exudate is like a, a coating of pus. So these are exudative tonsils uh, up there on the top. This is strep pyogenes, the strep throat. In the middle one there, uh, the pathognomonic <coughs> gray membrane in the back of the throat is diphtheria. <coughs> if you ever hear the words grayish membrane in the back of the throat, the answer is always diphtheria. And finally, gonococcal pharyngitis is illustrated down here in the bottom. If you have a really nasty sore throat, 90% of the time it's going to be a virus. 90% of all sore throats are viruses. Common symptoms of um, a strep throat are fever and sore throat. Cough is not a fever, is not a characteristic of strep throat, it is of a viral throat. If somebody has strep throat, the first time you diagnose strep throat with a strep tip, and you get up there and you say, say ah, and you're looking, and you smell, they, they breathe on you when they say ah, you're going to smell strep. Once you smell strep, to me it smells metallic. You never forget it. But the point of this is, you can't look at a throat and tell whether or not it's strep. You have to run a strep test. And there's a rapid strep test. Well, there's some things you need to consider. You have to ponder. If 90% of sore throats are viral, viruses don't respond to antibiotics, right? Well, 9 out of 10 times, it's not going to be strep. Well, let's, okay. But they have the metallic smell to the breath. I'm going to treat you for strep because I think you have strep because I smell it. If I'm going to treat you, don't do the test. Why should I do the test if I'm going to treat you? Really, the only time I do a strep test is if I'm not going to treat you. <coughs> I don't want to miss strep, but I think it's a virus. So I'm not going to treat you with antibiotics, but I'm going to get a strep test just to be sure. Okay? The other thing, though, is you need to ask somebody with a strep throat. You don't need to ask little children, but certainly all the people that show up to the uh, student clinics and you know people your age and teenagers and stuff about oral sex. Because if you have a negative strep test and there's been some oral sex in the background, that's how you get gonococcal pharyngitis. And the strep test will be negative. You don't want to miss gonococcal pharyngitis. <coughs> we are number one in the country in gonococcal pharyngitis. Yeah, we're number one in quite a few things, and that's, that's one of them. Um, so, uh, if you suspect gonococcal, you know, if I ask, if, if the strep test is negative and uh, it looks bad, you know, I might ask you, you know, have you, have you uh, had oral sex in the past uh, two weeks? Uh, not on you, but you on somebody else. You know what I mean? <laughs> Don't miss gonococcal pharyngitis. Okay? We're also big in syphilis here. Also big in syphilis. This area code 
The downtown area code, number one is syphilis in the country. Number one is syphilis. Um, that's where the Oklahoma County Jail is. It's that area code right there. I think it's 73106 or something like that. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> yeah, by the time we get through with this course, you're not going to kiss anybody. Okay. <laughs> um, if we look at the larynx, um, the larynx has uh, several different features here. Uh, you can see the thyroid cartilage is here. The, the larynx is contained within the thyroid cartilage. This illustration here is we've dissected from the back. And we open up the back of the esophagus and the oral pharynx. There's the uvula, there's the tongue, so the mouth is in the plane of the board. Here is our thyroid cartilage area. There's the back of the cricoid cartilage. back of the thyroid, that's quite what call it. Everything is covered by mucosa. If we remove the mucosa and the muscle and get down to the cartilages themselves, there's the thyroid cartilage. The epiglottis attaches to the thyroid cartilage. Here's the back of the cricoid cartilage. Sitting on top of the cricoid cartilage are two pyramidal shaped or pyramidal shaped cartilages called the arytenoids. On top of the arytenoids, there's a tiny little cartilage called the corniculate cartilage. The arytenoids are the important structures. They are pyramidal shaped. Coming off of this point is a ligament. That ligament is called the vocalis ligament. Vocalis ligament. They call it vocal ligament here. Vocalis ligament. That forms the basis for the vocal cords. <coughs> now, the thing about these um, arytenoid cartilages, again, they're sitting on top of the cricoid cartilage. They have muscles that act on the uh, arytenoids. So, if this, these, my fingers here represent the vocal ligament. The arytenoids can rotate on the top of that uh, arytenoid, I mean, excuse me, on the top of that cricoid cartilage, so you can move the vocal ligaments out or inwards. That's how your vocal cords work. Overlying the vocalis ligament is the vo vocalis muscle. Overlying that is the mucosa. There's the vocal cord right there. The true vocal cord. It's just called the vocal cord. Above it is another cord-like structure that does not participate in speech. That's called the false vocal cord. Some people call these false and true, but there is no true vocal cords. It's just the vocal cords. There are false vocal cords and vocal cords. And between them is the ventricle. Above them is the vestibule, this whole area up here. And down here, below the vocal cords, is called the infraglottic area. If you look at it in a coronal section, it looks like that. Here are the thyroid cartilages. There's the cricoid. The arytenoids are going to be right there. And there's the vocal ligament and the vocalis muscle and the vocal cord. This is what it looks like um, with a laryngoscopy. If you're lying on your back, it looks like an upside-down V. 
So these little knobby things right here, you see those little things right there? They would be the corniculate cartilages at the top of the arytenoids. These little things right here. Well, excuse me, there they are right there. That one and that one. <coughs> On the top of the arytenoids. This is the base of the arytenoids where you see the vocal bone. There's the vocal cord, there's the false vocal cord, uh, false, yeah, vocal cord right there. Okay? So when you talk, these things just go in and out. Uh, in December, one of our uh, ER physicians brings a fiber optic deal. He puts down his throat and he talks while you're watching his vocal cords go in and out on the screen. There's a video on YouTube that they did that to Stephen Tyler. Yeah, I think it's really cool. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> his daughter, I think, was is a good actress. Actor. She was in that movie with Tom Hanks, uh, that thing you do, or the, you know what the, the name of the movie? You know what I remember? <laughs> All right. Yes, ma'am. In that last picture, which side was dorsal and which was ventral? So here's the tongue up there. You follow the tongue down to the molecula. That's the epiglottis right there. And right behind the epiglottis is the opening to the vocal cords. So when you intubate somebody, as long as you take that tube and go right down the back side of the epiglottis, you're going to hit this area. Okay? Pretty easy to do. Out here, you see out here, this space, this dead space, that's the molecular. This space here and here is called the piriform recess. I'll show it to you in the next slide. This is the piriform recess. It's outside the larynx. There's the tongue, there's the molecular, epiglottis, cricoid, arytenoids, <coughs> piriform recess. Chicken bones and pills and things like that that you swallow and get stuck in your throat. The piriform recess is where they usually get stuck. <coughs> I had a patient one time in a rural emergency room. She had a, she had all, taken all these mega vitamins and she swallowed something and she got it stuck. And I know it's there, I can feel it. She was a nurse. It's right there, I can feel it. But I didn't have any instruments to go in there and get it or any mirrors to go look for it. So I did the only thing that you could possibly do. I turned her upside down, shook her, and it came out. Actually, I didn't turn her upside down. What I did was I had her lie down on the bed and with her waist and her head down, like that, and patted her on the back, and it came out. <laughs> Now here are the other uh, extrinsic muscles of the uh, tongue that don't have genio or glossus in the title necessarily. Remember the infraglottic, I mean the infrahyoids and the suprahyoids that you've just been tested over this morning. Now, there are several intrinsic muscles of the larynx. There are quite a few muscles that act on the arytenoids or act on the thyroid cartilage. You know, the vocalis ligament runs from the cricoid and attaches to the um, thyroid cartilage in the front. If you move the thyroid cartilage forward, you're going to tighten up the, vo the vocal cords. If you pull it, if you draw it back, you'll loosen them. So there's more to sound production than just uh, abducting and adducting the vocal cords. But they all, all of the muscles that act on the vocal cords, all of them act to close it, to close, to bring the vocal cords together, to add up them. The only muscle that acts to open the vocal cords 
is the posterior cricoarytenoid. The posterior cricoarytenoid. See, it originally arises from the cricoid and inserts into the lateral part of the arytenoid up here. So if this is my arytenoid cartilage, if I'm grabbing them from the side and I pull them this way, what's going to happen to the vocal folds? They're going to swing out. So the posterior cricoid arytenoid is the only one that abducts the vocal folds. Everything else adducts them. And they're all innervated by the recurrent Lorenzo nerve of cranial nerve 10. What is the surgery where that runs the greatest risk? Thoracotomy. Correct. The nerve and blood supply to the larynx. Um, I mentioned this in the last section. Here's a superior thyroid artery. There is a superior laryngeal artery that comes off of that. Goes through the thyrohyoid membrane. I'll say it again. Superior thyroid artery. There is a superior laryngeal artery. Goes through the thyrohyoid membrane. Off the vagus nerve, you have uh, the superior laryngeal vagal nerve that has an internal branch and an external branch that goes to the cricothyroid. I mentioned this last test block. That internal laryngeal nerve accompanies the artery through the thyrohyoid membrane. So that internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve supplies sensation above the vocal folds. That inter so that's the vagus nerve, right? The internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve supplies sensation above the vocal folds. Motor to the vocal folds and sensation below the vocal folds is the recurrent laryngeal. So when you get some, you swallow something, it goes down the wrong side, and it doesn't get past your vocal cords, that pain, that cough reflex, that something's not right, is that internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. If it gets down below your vocal cords, now you're in the trachea. Now you got problems. Because that's not coming right back out. Most of the time you have to get it. And finally, in front of the cervical vertebra, we talked about all these deep muscles of the back, the semispinalis, the splenius, and all those things. In front of the, the uh, cervical vertebra are two uh, strap muscles on either side. They're called the longus capitis. It inserts into the base of the skull and the longus coli that attaches from uh, cervical vertebra to cervical vertebra. These things will help, along with many other muscles, to flex the cervical spine. If only one side contracts, you're going to rotate the spine to look in that direction, along with other muscles like the sternocleidomastoid. These are deep muscles you're not going to find the innervation to them. Okay. All right. And I think that's probably enough for today. I know it's been a long day for you. Uh, so just get over to the lab, cut the hands in half, and uh, dig through the floor of the mount, according to the dissector, and find a few structures and we're done. Okay. Oh, another thing. You guys, the sheet that you have on the cadavers, you need to make that thing wet. They were drying out quite a bit this morning, and that only makes your practical harder. Uh, so you need to keep the, the cadavers more moist. Make sure that sheet is wet.
Some unspoken thing. I started out 